<coughs> we thought we'd get you started with a bit of uh, African uh, mood music. Um, hello everyone, I'm Dan Monk, uh, former director of the Peace and Conflict Studies at Program University, yay. Um, and uh, I am speaking today, uh, uh, I'm introducing today's speaker on behalf of Nancy Reese, the current director of Peace and Conflict Studies at Macaulay University, yay. Nancy is uh, suffering from bronchitis, and despite all the remarkable and hard work she's done in uh, organizing uh, this evening's lecture, um, she's been talking a lot and finding it hard to speak for extended periods of time. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pinch hitted for Nancy in this, in this regard. But we all owe her a debt of gratitude for the really remarkable work that she's done in, in organizing this evening's lecture. Um, we also uh, really want to uh, thank a number of uh, other individuals uh, right away uh, within within our own Kobe family. Uh, there's a uh, Barbara Brooks um, and, uh, and quite a number of others. Uh, it takes a lot of coordination to make an event like this happen across various sectors of the university. And so, thanks very much. Um, let me just say welcome to all of you, um, uh, especially to students, to our alumni friends, the staff, and to our new president, Jeff Hurst. Before I go ahead, just so that we can avoid uh, uncomfortable experiences and embarrassment, I'd like to invite you to turn off your cell phones. However important the call you're expecting is, it's probably going to be to have it be set to the side. Yeah? <laughs> Let me just tell you that, before we, as we start, um, that um, I love this picture. Uh, I love this picture. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I, it was, we found it last year when we, were, when we, when we began the first uh, Sharer uh, Memorial Lecture, and uh, included in it are a number of the gentlemen who are here with us tonight who helped to make this series and this initiative possible. But quite apart from that, I like it because, sorry, I like it because it reminds us of a time when Colgate was a really enlightened place and dogs were allowed on campus, <laughs> first of all. Um, I like it uh, because, in fact, it is really kind of interesting to see uh, these wonderful men who we've gotten to know in this process back in the day, and also because right in here, at this, sitting right in this row, we actually see Peter C. Scherer, after whom this lecture series and the Scherer Initiative is, is now named. So before I continue with my own formal introduction to this evening's lecture, I'd like to invite Bill Hitchens, who you, uh, Peter Scherer, who's been involved in this effort, to say a few words about, about Pete and about the initiative. I'm sitting next to Pete. That's you? <laughs> yes, I, you look the same. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, all. Uh, my name is Bill Hitchings. As, as uh, was said, I'm in the class of 65, which is in Pete is a uh, class of 65 also. I represent a group of people with gray hair who sit in the audience. And we began our career at Colgate about 50 years ago. 50 years ago, we were applying, we were seniors in high school, applying for uh, admission to Colgate University. A remarkable time. A lot of things were going on, and things in retrospect are, are very interesting. It was the end of the Eisenhower era, the end of the post-Cold War, uh, end of the post-World War II generation. It was the beginning of the JFK and the inauguration and the assassination of Kennedy. It was the start of the Vietnamese War and a very divisive war that has continued today. It was the start of the Civil War move, uh, of the Civil Rights Movement and Lawrence got involved with that. Pete Scherer, in whose name these lectures go forth, was a very remarkable guy. He was our classmate for three years, four years, and he was our friend for 30 years after that. Pete died 20 years ago of HIV AIDS, and we thought that this lecture series was a very way, appropriate way of, of remembering. Pete Scherer was a remarkable guy. 
Uh, he has an active life on campus. He was elected, he was selected for Canocioni. He was president of the student body for the senior year. He was a dorm advisor. Uh, one of the people here was, uh, was mentored by Pete. Pete was a career-long educator and spent his life in pursuit of education. He spent his life in pursuit of political equality and social justice. He was an educator among, above all. Uh, Pete had a remarkable voice. And Pete had this baritone, very resonant baritone voice. And you could hear it at Colgate Inn, at the bar at Colgate Inn on Friday nights, as well as the chapel choir on Saturday, on Sunday mornings. Before and after graduation, Pete dedicated his personal and professional life to education. He stayed here, got his master's degree, and then went on and continued for his doctorate degree. He served in higher education. He was an advocate, I say, of, of political justice and, and, and social equality. He was an activist. He was not a, he was not a passive person. He was a passionate, very passionate person. But the theme of Pete's life, I think, was continued learning and continued education, which is what brings us here tonight. Rick Stady, this gentleman here, had an idea several years ago about putting together a speaker series in remembrance of Pete, to, to honor Pete, to remember Pete's contribution and what he meant to us as a friend and what he meant as an educator. And this speaker series is the result of that. A very, very fitting tribute for a man who stayed involved with education. And that's what brings us here tonight. The spirit of education, you as students, and us as the old guys who want to continue our education, continue our learning process. So we tried to raise money. We're continuing to raise money to keep this speaker series an ongoing effort. Uh, we'll keep it going as long as we can, and uh, we are very happy to have uh, Professor Strauss here as the second speaker, distinguished speaker in, in this series. So congratulations. Congratulations for us. Congratulations for you guys. Thanks a lot. delivered an introduction from an iPad. At some point, something's going to go wrong, and we'll all learn something. Um, for over 10 years now, even more than 10 years, to be honest, I've been haunted by uh, a single passage in a, in a work of philosophy. Uh, looking at the barbarism that the 20th century produced with exactly the same type of rationality that we rely upon to make automobiles, this philosopher made the following observation, and it's a mouthful. He said, if thought is not measured by the extremity that eludes the concept, it is from the outset in the nature of the musical accompaniment with which the SS liked to drown out the screams of its victims. Now that's not an easy sentence to make sense of, even in the original German. But this is a university, and it is our obligation to try particularly when our intention is to focus on the kinds of issues that we're going to address tonight. Because in fact, this difficult passage concerns genocide. And more specifically, it concerns the concept of genocide that we advance when we speak about the administered murder of millions. Without the self-reflection of thinking, this philosopher argues, without, in other words, bringing our thinking to bear on the very concept that we bring to bear on genocide, we participate in a historical order that makes the enduring suffering of millions possible to begin with. Now, I open this 
evening's event, this lecture, with this meditation, because it seems to me that this demand, this renewed demand for a critical reflection upon the given concepts of political violence, seems thus far to characterize the intellectual projects of the scholars who have been invited to deliver the Sharer Memorial Lectures, all two of them. Last year's speaker, Darius Rajawi, shakes to the core the given conceptions of torture that have largely seen this phenomenon as an emanation of totalitarian politics, showing us how, in fact, contemporary torture techniques are the children of democracies. Rajali forces us to recognize anew what we've committed to go unsaid when we actually say torture. To the many students, alumni, and faculty who have read and are now familiar with his work, it should be clear that the research of this evening's speaker, Scott Strauss, also challenges the received understandings of things like the Rwandan genocide, and in ways that complicate and productively highlight the inadequacy of the very concept of genocide itself, particularly, or normative concepts of genocide themselves, particularly as they refer to the perpetrators, the genocidaire, of such atrocity and their motives. I can think of no more fitting an aim for the Sharer Initiative and for the labors of PECON as a whole than that this kind of thinking against itself should be prized, studied, and learned in forums such as this. And for this reason, I want to thank our alumni friends once again for having made this evening possible. Dr. Scott Strauss is an Associate Professor of Political Science and International Studies and Founding Director of the Human Rights Initiative at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. While working as a journalist in Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, Scott Strauss witnessed the violent aftermath there from the Rwandan genocide, which killed half a million people in three months in 1994. Questioning the grasp, questioning to grasp how such events are possible led him to undertake field research in Rwanda in 2002, which formed the basis for his own doctoral work in political science at the University of California, Berkeley. Strauss's meticulous micro-level examinations of a huge range of archival and geographic data, his nationwide survey of convicted killers, and his 230 interviews with genocide perpetrators in Rwanda <coughs> prisons overturned both popular and scholarly narratives of the genocide. It was not ethical. Ethnic hatred, he argues, that caused this genocide and drove its killers, nor was it so called hate radio, one of the more common uh, uh, arguments, nor was it mere deprivation and greed. In his remarkable 2006 book, The Order of Genocide, which is for sale outside for any of you who would like to purchase it, and I'm sure Dr. Struss is more than happy to sign a copy for you. This is my Oprah moment. Um, <laughs> So, it, in his remarkable 2006 book, The Order of Genocide, Race, Power, and War in Rwanda, published by Cornell University Press, Strauss argued that war, militarization, and mass mobilization by a weakened political elite were, in fact, the preconditions for genocide in Rwanda. The Order of Genocide received a 2006 Award for Excellence um, in Political Science and Government from the Association of American Publishers, a second book, Intimate Enemy, Images and Voices of the Rwandan Genocide, with transcripts from some of Strauss's interviews and photographs by Robert Lyon, was published by Zone Books in 2006. Strauss is co-author of Africa's Installed Development, International Causes and Cures, which came out in 2003, and is the translator of Jean-Pierre Chrétien's book, The Great Lakes of Africa, 2000 Years of History. A co-edited volume, Remaking Rwanda, State Building and Human Rights After Mass Violence, is forthcoming from the University of Wisconsin Press. Dr. Strauss's articles have appeared in World Politics, Politics and Society, Foreign Affairs, Genocide Studies and Prevention, the Journal of Genocide Research, and he has received grants from the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, the National Science Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, and the United States Institute for Peace. In 2009, he was awarded the William P. E. Hoffer Distinguished Teaching Award at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So in celebration of the memory of Peter C. Scherer and an expression of our commitment to the rigorous study of contemporary conflict and its effects, 
Please join me in welcoming Dr. Scott Strauss. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank um, Dan for the generous introduction. I want to thank Nancy for her incredible organizational skills and, uh, and just general help on this project. And Kathy, she's in the room, and all of you for coming. I also want to say it's a tremendous honor to have been invited to give this lecture. Peter Scherer sounds like a, quite a remarkable, remarkable person, and it sounds like what, what friends of Peter have done is just also really remarkable. So it's a great honor for me to be here and to be speaking as part of the Memorial Lecture Series. So thank you so much for the, for the invitation. I wanted to start my talk a little bit differently than, than normal academic talks would start, and that is really to talk about how it is that I've come to devote my professional life to understanding the causes and consequences of political violence. And Dan has in some ways prefigured this. But my background is certainly sh similar to some of the people in this room. I grew up in New York City. I lived a pretty sheltered life. I went to private school. The only real memories I have of violence is getting mugged when I was six on, on 79th Street and uh, catching a cross ball looking the wrong direction and getting creamed by a defenseman. It was not my best sports moment. So how did, how did it happen that I got interested in these topics? Well, the, the real issue is that I, when I was in college, I went on a foreign study program and in Kenya, and I became very interested in Africa as a result, and I became interested in journalism. And to make a long story short, after college, I moved to Nairobi, Kenya, where I became a freelance journalist for a number of years. Now, at the time, I had no interest in covering wars. I had no interest in conflict. I had no interest in violence. But a year later, there was a major story breaking in what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. And with some strong encouragement from my editors, who said, this is a huge story, you need to go. I, it turns out I was in Mogadishu, Somalia, not exactly a wonderful place to be. And so I left Mogadishu, flew back to Nairobi, got some stuff, flew on to Rwanda, and made it down to Congo. Now, these were particularly heavy days. I had no idea, to be honest, what was really going on in Congo. It would turn out to be the first of two wars in Congo, some of which I'll describe later. But uh, let me say that now that what we were witnessing was the aftermath of the Rwandan genocide being played out inside Congolese territory. Rwandan forces had teamed up, teamed up with some local Congolese rebels. They were invading Congo. They were breaking up some Rwandan refugee camps there and eventually would challenge and topple the Congolese state. But I entered Congo not knowing any really much of that. It turns out after I entered Congo, the border closed, and I was stuck on the other side of Congo and started and, and hit. And, um, and I soon found myself face to face with the war. I'd never been in a war before, and I found myself face to face one. A lot happened in those days, and the two particular most memorable moments came on a day, November 15th of 1996, when the refugee camps were, were, were destroyed, and on that day, literally, Hundreds of thousands of Rwandan Hutu refugees came streaming out of the camps on foot, carrying all they had on their heads, in their bags, and heading towards Rwanda. And as they were going this way, I was going the other direction, trying to figure out where this line of refugees had started. Now, I don't use the term stream lightly. It's a metaphor I need. It sounded like a river of noise. It felt like a, like a flow of people. And as when I got up and looked on a hill, all I could see were people moving in all directions. It was an extraordinary, extraordinary sight. At the end of the refugee flow, when I finally got there, there was uh, a mass grave, and one that had freshly killed women, children, and, and men. And it was a hideous sight. And I'm not going to describe it any more than that. And it had an uh, incredible impact on me. Now, like other journalists and, and soldiers, I found war to be exhilarating. It's not a wish it weren't true, but it is. Almost nothing matches the intensity of being in war. But intellectually, it was my experience with the Rwandan refugees, it was my experience of this mass grave that left me with a burning question that has really driven me ever since, which is, how do you make sense of this terrible violence? 
How do you explain that so many people would upend their lives and be on the move? How do you explain a mass grave like the one that I had seen? How could any of this be happen? How could it happen? And as I began to understand the region better, I, I began to realize that it really the key event was the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. And I went back to graduate school and really dedicated myself to trying to understand this root event, the Rwandan genocide, which culminated in the book that Dan so generously mentioned and, um, and to a lifelong, well, I don't know, lifelong, up until this point, uh, interest in political violence and in war. Now my, my, my talk today is not specifically on Rwanda, it's not specifically on Congo, though I'll talk about those places later, and I would be especially excited to, excited to talk in the question and answer session after I give my prepared remarks. But rather today, I want to take on a broader topic, and that concerns a history of political violence in Africa, in independent Africa, and an assessment of what the future of violence might hold inside of Africa. Now, by political violence, let me say at the outset, what I mean are beatings, killings, massacres, wars, genocides, and other forms of deliberate, physical, usually public violence, not necessarily structural violence or private and domestic violence. These are important forms of violence, but not what I'm going to focus on here. And even more specifically tonight, I want to focus on three main forms of political violence. On war, in particular civil war, which is the principal form of violence in the developing world. Uh, second, I want to focus on genocide and other forms of state orchestrated mass killing of civilians. And finally, briefly, I want to talk a little bit about electoral violence. Now again, there are other forms of political violence that matter. I'm just trying to limit a uh, an, already broad, uh, an already broad talk today. Now in the talk, I want to ask four main questions. First, how important has political violence been for independent Africa? And in what ways has political violence been important? Second, I want to ask what the major trends of political violent, violence on the continent have been and how the patterns of violence are changing in Africa. Third, I want to ask the question as to whether or not violence in Africa is different from other regions, whether there's anything specific about the prevalence or the duration of violence compared to other regions. And finally, I want to ask something about what the causes and consequences of political violence are. Now, that's a fairly, that's a tall order, I recognize that. And I'm going to be going through a fair amount of information, so let me just start out by previewing what the main arguments or main points that I want to make are. First, political violence has been a central dimension of independent Africa. However, at the same time, in comparison to other world regions, the data show, and I will point to data later, that Africa is not exceptional in either the frequency or the duration of political violence. Second, I want to stress that variation matters. By variation, I mean that there are differences across states in Africa, and by variation, I mean that there is a change over time. Even though this talk is framed broadly around violence in post-independence, post-colonial Africa, uh, it's very important not to think of Africa as a single lump sum, but to make distinctions across places and across time. Third, I want to argue that patterns of warfare are changing in Africa and perhaps elsewhere. We're seeing a general decline of big wars and a persistence of small wars. These are wars, the latter are wars that last a long time, that have increasingly strong transnational dimensions that intersect with cross-border criminality and international terrorism in some cases, and that show no sign of going away. Um, in that vein, I would also identify three main zones of conflict that I will give you some maps of later. First, the Sahel region, stretching from Mali to the Central African Republic. Second is the Horn of Africa, uh, centered in Somalia, but extending to Sudan and Ethiopia. And finally, the Great Lakes of Africa, my general region, which would be centered in Congo, but extending to 
northern Uganda to Rwanda and, and to Burundi. Fourth, and related to some of the, the last two points I made, I want to argue that we're seeing a general decline of warfare in addition to a shift from big to small wars. We're seeing a decline of warfare and the stabilization of large parts of the continent. So I don't think war is over. It's just that it's changing, and I think that what we're seeing are pockets of serious stability in Southern Africa in particular, in parts of East Africa, and parts of West Africa. Finally, I want to argue that we underappreciate the importance of resilience and resistance to violence. That is, I'm not being kind of Pollyannish in making this point, I'm not being naive, but empirically, given what we know about the causes of civil war, and mass killing, in a way, those phenomena should be more frequent than they have been. And I think that what that should alert us to is the often invisible ways that Africans and African politics are militating against the outbreak of political violence. This is not something that is studied very well, and my simple point here is to say we should be paying attention to the ways in which violence is avoided, in addition to why it happens. Now, why does it matter? Why should we care about this particular topic? So first of all, I think across many states in Africa, what we're seeing is a great deal of reflection after 50 years of independence. This year, 2010, is the 50th anniversary of, of the independence of a number of African states, in particular in French, former French West Africa, Francophone countries, and the next, this year and also next year and the year after will be the case for some British and Belgian colonies. And I think many Africans and many of us who care about Africa are asking the question, what has the post-colonial experience been? What do we make of these 50 years of independence? It's an opportunity to ask big <laughs> questions like I'm doing, and I see the, the place of political violence as part of this ongoing reflection. Um, second, I think that on balance, political violence has had negative effects, negative consequences for a number of issues that we care about deeply. Civil war disproportionately affects civilians in negative ways. These consequences include direct targeting and killing. It includes forced displacement within countries or across countries. In fact, atrocities occur at a systematically greater rate in wartime rather than in peacetime. Wars leave harsh legacies. They destroy infrastructure. They create trauma. They have negative health outcomes. They make people not able to go to school. All of these things are outcomes that we care about. At the same time, it's important to note, it, to note that once wars end, that African states have shown a remarkable capacity for regeneration and for growth, even economic growth, after wars have ended. But nonetheless, I think on balance, the consequences are negative. <coughs> the third issue is I think that there's a foreign policy dimension here. Uh, it's clear that internationalism thrives in the presence of <coughs> conflict and state absences. Al-Qaeda affiliates are making a play for the Sahel. They're making a play for Somalia. And I think there's every reason to expect that trend to continue. Africa is also increasingly important economically, in part through trade, in part through trade uh, oil. And political violence and instability run contrary to those interests. And finally, I think that there's Af Africa risks in, fu in the future being a potential theater of confrontation with China, thinking about global politics. And I think that also <coughs> means we should be caring about uh, these issues in Africa. So. so I want to turn now to an overall discussion of trends in the major forms of political violence, starting with war. And this, these data, which I'll talk, talk about in a second, were collected through the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, which measures war at different levels. And the first point that I want to make, which is not evident from this data, is that war has been a central feature of Africa's post-colonial political history. About 30 countries in sub-Saharan Africa have experienced an armed conflict since independence. That's roughly 65% of, uh, of, of Sub-Saharan Africa. 
Now the basic trend line, what this shows, this is showing different forms of war. The most important is the red line, which are civil war. These blues are uh, interstate wars, and these are so-called internationalized civil wars. And the basic trend line here is you see a steady accumulation of onset of different wars up through the 1990s, peaking in the early 1990s with about 17 different conflicts, uh, and then a steady decline thereafter. So that uh, we're looking now at around eight or nine armed conflicts in sub-Saharan Africa, and rather than double that at right after the end of the Cold War. So even while recognizing that armed conflict has been central to the political history of post-colonial Africa, one has to recognize both its variation across time, and in particular, the decline in recent years of major wars. Now, some of these wars have been very long wars, lasting decades. That was the case for Sudan, it was the case for Angola, it was the case for other places. Some wars have been very short. In Mali, some areas are endem have endemic conflict, like Chad in the Central African Republic, northern Uganda. Other places, like Rwanda, have a periods of authoritarian rule marked by intense armed conflict marked by periods of authoritarian rule. So there's quite a bit of variation across different conflicts and across time. Now one important question to ask is whether or not South Sub-Saharan Africa compares, or how it compares to other regions, in particular in terms of the frequency, duration, and brutality of wars. Now before I put together the data for this talk, I've been worried about this talk for about six months now. Anyway, <laughs> uh, truly. I don't know when Dan initially emailed me, but I put a lot of time into this talk. But anyway, I put together some data on this, and um, the answers are quite surprising. It turns out that, first of all, in terms of frequency, this shows duration, which I'll come to in a second. In terms of frequency, African states are not the most, are not the leader, if you will, in the number of wars. That distinction essentially goes to Asia where if you look at the number of wars divided by the number of countries, the prevalence of war is greater in Asia from 1960 to 2008, greater than it is in Africa. Um, uh, Africa has the largest number of armed conflicts, but also has the, number, the largest number of countries. So. Uh, now, a similar uh, pattern holds true if you look at the question of, dura of duration, which is what this particular chart shows. And if you look at this, the red, again, are civil wars, the uh, brown are, um, are internationalized internal conflicts, and what this basically shows is that African wars are not necessarily longer. In fact, they're not longer than three of the five regions represented here. Again, the distinction really goes to Asia, which seems to have the longest armed conflicts. Now, brutality is harder to measure. I should also add that if you look at it per capita, that these trends are not true. That is, Asia has about four times as many people as Africa does, so that per capita it would be a different ratio. But just in terms of number of the duration of wars um, and the number of wars per country, the, Asia is the leader. Now, brutality is hard to measure. Are African wars more brutal than other places? And we don't have very good data. But even here, the data does not clearly indicate that African wars are more violent towards civilians than other regions. Um, uh, I would point to the work of Dara Cohen, who is a political scientist at the University of Minnesota now, and she works on sexual violence in civil war, and she finds that sexual violence is no more prevalent in Africa than other regions. As I'll discuss later, I find that Africa's rate of mass killing in war is also not greater than it is in Asia. Now, I don't mean to engage in a kind of crude regionalism here. It's one region is better or worse than the other region or whatever. Um, the main point is to acknowledge that armed conflict has been central to Africa's post-colonial history, but at the same time, it's important to correct certain assumptions that Africa's proclivity to armed conflict and to atrocities in armed conflict is somehow unique and somehow distinctive vis-a-vis -vis other regions. Now, another important question to ask is whether or not the dynamics of armed conflict have changed over time in Africa, and if so, how? And this is also not necessarily an easy question to answer. Now, the conventional wisdom is that wars have become more brutal in terms of violence against civilians, 
to the violence against civilians in terms of the presence of non-professional combatant forces and in terms of the non-ideological goals of combatants in wars. This is the so-called New Wars thesis. If Che Guevara was our image of the Cold War, Civil War warrior, in Africa it would be the good fight in South Africa or the good fight in Eritrea where you had uh, principal ideology, the combatants were well trained, they were fighting for a cause and so forth. By contrast, the image of the post-Cold War warrior would be Fode Sanko in Sierra Leone or Charles Taylor in Liberia. They represent war, so-called warlords who fight to control diamond mines to get rich, who use child soldiers and whose forces engage in brutalities against civilians, and so on and so forth. So we're left, I think, with the empirical question of whether or not African wars today are more violent towards civilians than they were in the past, and whether or not there are general differences. And I think that I conclude from studying the evidence that there is a difference of degree, but not a difference of type. And what do I mean by that? Uh, new wars are, in short, more violent towards civilians but that the distinction should not be overstated. The real issue here is that civil wars are almost always brutal towards civilians, whether in Africa or elsewhere, or at least contemporary civil wars are. So it's true, yes, that in Congo, in northern Uganda, in Darfur, in Somalia, wars today are fought with enormous brutality towards civilians, and I'll come back to that later. It's generally true that these combatants are not well trained. With some exceptions, they're not fighting ideological wars. But these, in some ways, are not new dimensions. If you look at the wars of the 1970s and 1980s, insurgent groups in Mozambique and Angola used terrible brutality against civilians. If you look at state-sponsored mass killing, uh, the wars in Nigeria, the Biafran Civil War, Idi Amin and Milton Obote in Uganda, the Burundi Genocide of 1972, these were enormously <coughs> violent towards uh, civilians. So it's the point being here is that it's not that violence against civilians as a tactic in war is necessarily new. Now, what I would point us to, in fact, is a different set of changes, not so much new wars or old wars, but rather that what we are seeing and have seen is a decline of big wars. Now, by big wars, I mean liberation wars, secessionist wars, anti-dictator wars, and other wars of kind of grand ideology that were often fought for state control, that often pitted large armies against each other, and, and armies that often had funding from Cold War sources, the United States, the Soviet Union, Cuba, etc. Here I have in mind the wars of Southern Africa, Angola, Mozambique, Namibia, Zimbabwe, South Africa, wars in the Horn, in Ethiopia against the Derg, in Somalia against Siad Bari, in South Sudan against the North. These were big wars, but they all have essentially ended with the possible exception of Southern Sudan, which I'll come back to uh, later. What we have, by contrast today, are a number of small wars. They have factionalized, divided armed insurgents, they tend to be wars that are on the peripheries of large states. They tend to last a long time. They're very difficult to end, for reasons I'll talk about in Q&A if you want. They often draw funding from illicit trade, from banditry, from international terrorist networks. And these are wars that have greater cross-border dimensions than ever before. So what are some examples of, um, of these uh, of these Wars. So in uh, Ethiopia, in the Agadah, in Somalia, you have El Shabaab. In Sudan, you have uh, Darfur um, in the in the eastern part, so western part of Darfur. In Chad, you've got a series of little wars in the eastern part. In Central African Republic, there are these small wars in the periphery. In northern Uganda, you have the Lord groups over here. You have the North Resistance Army, which moves into Sudan and Congo and Central Africa. In uh, Senegal, you have a long-running insurgency in the Casamance region. In Mali, you have 
a, a uh, come back to later, Al Qaeda affiliated and so forth, in uh, northern Namibia. But these are probably wars that most of you have never heard of, with the exception perhaps of Somalia. Now, you can ask whether or not there are some exceptions to these trends. These are, again, small wars. The number of insurgents is hard to know, but it's in the hundreds, not the thousands, I would say. Now, are there exceptions to this trend? And one of them would be um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where I started. And the Democratic Republic of Congo is, at its height, had about seven different states intervening in what was called Africa's uh, First World War. And it's estimated that about 5 million civilians have died in Congo between 1998 and 2005, which is an enormous number. It's said to be the deadliest conflict since World War II. Now, uh, most of the states, however, today have withdrawn from the Congo. And what you're left with in Congo are a series of local armed actors that fight for control of territory, that are engaging in illicit traffic of mineral resources, that use tremendous brutality against, uh, against civilians. So in short, I think that even though Congo, 10 years ago, eight years ago, was different from the general trend, even today in Congo, the pattern of small wars, transborder wars, illicit trade, and so forth, is, is appropriate. Um, so um, the second thing that I would say is that we are seeing um, emerging patterns of warfare that are different from the past in the sense that the transnational connections are greater. There's a stronger link to terrorist violence and a degree of interconnection with banditry and criminality that we haven't really seen as much, at least in my sense, from wars in the past. And I'll come to that in a second. And then finally, I think what we can see are different zones of interlocking, interlocking conflict that remain. And these are going to be the Sahel, the Horn, and the Great Lakes of Africa. And let me kind of zoom in on these regions. Now, um, this is the African Sahel in West Africa. And essentially what you have are these very large states of Mali and Niger and Chad, the Central African Republic, and you have historic rebellions in the north of Mali and the north of Niger. And what you have today are, uh, is an international uh, terrorist organization called Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb that initially came down from Algeria and has installed itself inside of Mali, inside of Mali that draws from fighters from Mauritania, from Algeria, from Nigeria, and other countries. And their main principal activity is to take, ter uh, take hostages, go into the mountains of Mali, the desert and mountains of Mali, and demand ransom. In the name of in the name of Islamic Islamist political movement, they operate between Niger and southern Algeria and Mauritania. They pose an enormous challenge to the countries of the, of this region, uh, and this I think is one of the zones. Again, small wars, uh, transborder, engaging in criminality, and so on and so forth. You also have in Chad a series of small rebellions, Central African Republic, a series of small rebellions. So I think this zone is one of the big zones of conflict that we uh, are seeing. We turn now to the Great Lakes of Africa, and the Great Lakes of Africa generally refer to Uganda, to Eastern Congo, uh, Burundi, Rwanda, and Eastern Tanzania. I'm sorry, Western Tanzania. And um, here, the epicenter would be the Democratic Republic of Congo, as I just described. And here you continue to have uh, small, uh, small armed groups that operate in particular areas, that take control of different mineral resources. You have a non-functioning states. Um, so these are kind of little fiefdoms, little armed conflicts that are causing terrible devastation in the Congo. You also have, in Burundi, it looks like the beginning of a new armed conflict. You have, in northern Uganda, an organization called the Lord's Resistance Army. They're a claim to fame as they take children as soldiers, child soldiers, abduct children, make them into child soldiers. They operate inside of Congo, inside of Sudan, inside the Central African Republic. But the number of active fighters is relatively few. The, level, the number of engagements, combatant on combatant engagement, engagement in northern Uganda, relatively few. And so I think typical of this pattern of small wars. Finally, you have the Horn of Africa, another regional 
set of issues. The set, epicenter is in Somalia, where you essentially haven't had a government since uh, the United Nations and the United States withdrew its troops in the early 1990s. I mean, you have a nominal government, but you have no real state control in Somalia. And the main issue in Somalia now is that you have a, an Al-Qaeda-inspired insurgency, uh, Al-Shabaab, that has both regional and international connections. And you have, um, that war has drawn in Ethiopia. Um, uh, Ethiopia here um, for, in different ways. It's drawn in Uganda, which has peacekeepers inside of Somalia, and in retaliation during the World Cup, Somalia and surges, Somali insurgents bombed um, different stations inside Kampala, the capital of Uganda. You have uh, the, um, uh, a series of small wars inside of Ethiopia. You have the Darfur conflict, which has caused tremendous devastation. But even the war in, in Sudan is today, the Darfur conflict, are a series of different small insurgencies that are fighting with each other as much as they're fighting the central state and uh, moving across the border from Chad, between Chad and Sudan. And again, fitting this pattern of small wars, transborder wars, small insurgencies, divided insurgencies, and, um, and so on and so forth. The big question is Southern Sudan. That is, if you talk to policymakers, the big issue is what's going to happen in Southern Sudan. Southern Sudan has been at peace since two, I mean, uh, yeah, it's been at peace since 2005, I think that's fair to say, and it's part of the peace agreement with the North. This had been, for those who are not familiar with Sudan, there had been a long-running, multiple long-running civil wars in Sudan between North and South. And in um, 2005, a peace agreement was reached, and one of the conditions of the peace agreement was that in, two, in 2011, there would be a referendum as to whether or not southern Sudan could become an independent country. And that referendum is scheduled to take place this January. But there are huge numbers of, of issues that remain outstanding. That is, in particular, where the dividing line will be, where the oil wells will be, on which side of the border Sudan has a lot of oil, uh, what will happen to different groups that live on different sides of the eventual border. And there's quite a bit of concern that this will become a, uh, a major war, not so much a small war. But my bottom line here is that we're dealing with three major zones of conflict, these small wars, transborder issues, and, and kinds of just things that just now let me turn my attention to um, mass killing and genocide. And this is really what my own research is really primarily uh, about. And I, I, I teach about Africa, I teach about political violence, but it's really genocide that is the thing that drives my research. What led me to spend six months in Rwandan prisons, what is really my driving, what the thing that I really most want to understand is why genocide happens. So genocide, as I'll talk about later, is linked to armed conflict, but in any case, um, so let me just address in the way I talked about our conflict, but in a shorter way, the question of mass killing and genocide. And this data comes from something called the Political Instability Task Force, which I'm happy to talk about their data uh, later. But first of all, the data show that Africa is not the region that is most prone to mass killing and to genocide. From 1964, there are some 20 distinct episodes of mass killing in Sub-Saharan Africa with 48 states, compared to about 22 total episodes in Asia, compared to eight in the Middle East. So in relative and absolute terms, Africa is not necessarily the leader here. Uh, looked at over time, the big trend is that there was a peak in the 1980s and uh, 19, uh, um, 1970s and 1980s but a decline in the 1990s and a further decline in the 2000s. So that today, in the 2000s, there have been five episodes of mass killing and genocide, whereas in the 1980s, that number was closer to, to nine. Now, these incidents have taken a terrible toll. You look at and you spend time in these regions, you understand how devastating these genocides and mass killing episodes have been in multiple different ways. But at the same time, it's important to recognize that there has been a steady decline since the 1980s. Now, I want to just quickly mention the question of electoral violence, which is another important dimension of political violence. And essentially here, I'm talking about violence related to elections. 
This became well known in the, the in Kenya, in, in Zimbabwe, and a couple other countries. And essentially, we don't have that much data on it. So I, together with a graduate student at Wisconsin, collected data on all elections in Africa since 1990. And the basic conclusion here is that violence, serious violence in African elections is relatively limited. It occurs in about 20% of cases. And that there's no overall trend line. That is, if you look at the average in 1990 compared to 2005, that you're seeing similar levels of electoral violence uh, across, across time. And I'll come back to this later, but I would expect this trend line uh, to continue. Now, before moving to a conclusion, let me talk a little bit about the causes of and determinants of war and genocide. And there's no particular consensus about what causes civil war, what causes genocide. But I think that we can find a number of uh, points of consensus that I want to quickly review for you here. Um, first of all, one of the big points is that it's the conditions that favor insurgency that seem to make one state more vulnerable to civil war compared to another state. And the main conditions that are seen to facilitate insurgency are weak states and the presence of a kind of what's called rough terrain, mountains, swamps, thick forests, places where insurgents can hide. A second leading explanation is that it's kind of economic endowments that are matter, in particular oil and high value minerals. And the leading argument here is that wars need financing and that these kinds of resources allow rebel organizations and states to uh, have finance even in the conditions of armed conflict. There are other arguments related to resources which I won't go into. Um, there's another argument about bad neighborhoods, which basically if you have one war in one country, it increases the risk of war in a neighboring country. There are arguments about the importance of ethnic diversity. That is, in Africa in particular, you have high levels of ethnic diversity, and that uh, can uh, be a risk factor for armed conflict. There's some other arguments as well. I'm not going to review all of them, but just to make the last point that there also is an important argument about history that's worth mentioning. Um, and that the point being that at independence, many African states were simply the inheritors of artificial boundaries that um, brought together groups that had no previous history of cooperation, and colonial politics were sometimes quite violent. So Africa inherited at independence some qualities that would have made it uh, uh, vulnerable to, uh, to civil war. Now, I'm persuaded by most of these arguments. In the interest of time, I won't necessarily explain why, but if you look at any of the zones that I talked about, whether it be the Sahel, whether it be uh, the Great Lakes or the Horn, you can see many of these dimensions playing out and playing out uh, powerfully. But what I would draw your attention to is that these various factors characterize many states in Africa. And um, while they have facilitated a number of wars and they remain salient, it's also true that there are many places where these things exist where war has not great broken out. And what I think that should draw our attention to is the importance of resilience and the management and avoidance of conflict, as well as the uh, causes. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the causes of mass killing. Why is mass killing and genocide happening? The single most important empirical finding, and this was the case in my research on Rwanda as well, is that um, war is a central determining factor of mass killing and genocide. Um, that wars tend to occur, genocides tend to occur in wars. War matters because it legitimizes violence, it heightens insecurity, and, and so forth. There are other factors. I think that's the most important. It's a question of political instability, question of past discrimination, question of having capable states that commit genocide and mass killing. Um, but what I would also draw attention to here is that, again, many situations in Africa fit these, these determinants. And um, most wars in Africa don't result in mass killing, whether it be Mali or Cote d'Ivoire or other places. Uh, and so what that should alert us to are restraint mechanisms, mechanisms that prevent the outbreak of major forms of conflict and violence. So let me take a stab at that, and then I will uh, conclude in the interest of time. Um, uh, what is it that keeps war from breaking out? 
And what is it that, um, that prevents actors from engaging in mass atrocities once war breaks out? What limits the effects of war in different African states? And I don't, this is a question that I don't think has received the kind of attention that it has. It's not very well researched. And so I want to offer you some observations, but um, to be followed up on with later research. And the first point I want to make is if you look at the micro level, at the family level, at the neighborhood level, that cooperation and norms of reciprocity, people getting along, is the norm rather than the exception. Violence is the exception rather than uh, the norm. And I think I want to just put that out there. But I would extend that even to national politics, where if you look across the continent, Botswana, Mali, Ghana, Malawi, Senegal, Zambia, other places, what you find are the persistence of forms of elite cooperation, elite bargaining, and, um, and, and other forms of nonviolent non accommodation. This is happening all the time in places that, in ways that we're not seeing. Um, I also would say that in places where you have middle classes, in places like Kenya and Gabon and Zambia and Cote d'Ivoire, that there are domestic pressures for the, either the containment or the avoidance of armed conflict, which matter. Domestic you know, actors pressuring their leaders, saying, we have a lot to lose. Please limit the kind of violence that you're doing. I point to the growth of NGOs, civil society. I'm not, poly, I, I'm not naive about the problems of civil society and NGOs. But they form a layer. Their growth in Africa has formed, I think, a layer of protection against, uh, against conflict. I'd also point to questions of national political culture, which I won't go into in the interest of time. The point is that these are not, not that these are insurmountable obstacles to war, but that they often matter in limiting the devastation when war occurs or in preventing war from, from occurring. I think at the international level, in general, the international community has gotten better at the management of conflict. If you look at peacekeeping, again, I'm not naive about peacekeeping, but peacekeeping has grown. It's become more sophisticated. It's gotten better mandates. It's gotten better information. There are larger missions. I think all, all told has had a positive effect on the, on the extent of warfare. I think African regional diplomacy has become quite important. When a terrible event is starting to happen, what you see now that you didn't used to see as much, from what I can tell, is that leaders of neighboring states will go into those states and say, no, 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 don't do this. It's going to have all these effects. Whether it be Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, lots of places where I think that's happening. I even think justice mechanisms have become so much stronger since the end of the Cold War that when something happens now, I think there, there should be the expected outcome that there will be a judicial mechanism or some kind of accountability. And I think that also is a positive, uh, positive development. So to conclude, um, as I said, I think that war has been fundamental to Africa's post-colonial history. At the same time, I think Africa is not uniquely prone to violence and to war. And given Africa's history, given its endowments, we might have expected more war than we've seen. Second, though I haven't spent as much time on this, in part because the evidence is mixed, I think on balance, wars have negative domestic consequences in terms of uh, civilian suffering in war, in terms of public health, in terms of education, in terms of social cohesion, in terms of trauma, in terms of infrastructure. And I'm happy to give you anecdotes if you want. On the other hand, I think one also has to admire in post-conflict states the amazing ability for regeneration, whether it's in Angola, Sierra Leone, uh, uh, Liberia, and other places. There are questions to ask, but I think um, it's important. Third, war isn't over, as some people might say, but it's changing. As I've argued, we have almost no big wars left in Africa. What we're left with are small wars, factionalized insurgents operating on the periphery that are hard to end, that have transborder dimensions, transnational dimensions, and links to international terrorism and illicit trade. Fourth, I think that we should um, Pay attention, as I just said, 
to the importance of restraint and cooperation and the avoidance of conflict and those mechanisms that promote the limits on war and violence at both domestic and international uh, level. Uh, finally, I think what we should expect uh, or what the other pattern I see that I see emerging is uh, is a different trajectories now of, of stability and development. Uh, Ghana, Botswana, Burkina Faso, Gamba, Gabon, Zambia, Senegal, a couple other places are really quite stable, and I have every expectation that they will continue to be stable, <coughs> and that the constraint and the avoid the properties of avoiding war are very strong. You have other places in a kind of fragile recovery, places like Uganda, Burundi, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia. Uh, and then finally, you have these zones of deep conflict that I, talk, that I talked about earlier. And so I think it's important to recognize this variation, this emerging variation in Africa that is, is, is I think, is very important. What should we expect for the future? Any political scientist, social scientist, humanities person who says they know the future should uh, be seriously, you know, one should be careful not to predict the future. But I would expect that these trends to continue. I would expect that we should see the continuation of these small wars, maybe with the exception of southern Sudan. I think we should expect to see atrocities in war, but not large, organized, systematic mass killings, or at least as many of them. Uh, in terms of genocide. I think we should expect to see electoral violence. I think we might even see other forms of, of political violence. Um, I haven't talked about, but uh, in particular, local violence over access to resources. Um, but those, I think, are the trends that I expect to see in the future. So that's a lot of information. Thank you very much for the talk. Take your questions. Yes. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you're talking to a large extent in the abstract, and you know, it's hard for me to. It's, it's hard for me, and I'm, I'm thinking about many people here to really uh, feel in my gut what uh, genocide is all about. You know, I know you don't want to turn this into a you know, a, a graphic presentation, but how, how do you get that across? I mean, you were there, you felt it, and that motivated you to do all this work. Well, we're not there, and I, you know, I've not been in war. Okay. Uh, can, I can you translate uh, somehow or bring that home, uh, uh, perhaps with an example, without uh, getting too, uh, over the I think that, well, let me start with genocide and then talk about war if you want. Um, the question feels you to is how do you make it feel real to you if you're, if you're doing this? Um, well, it's incredibly scary. You know, it's, in many ways, fear, I think fear is the dominant emotion that one feels in war. Because you don't know what's going to happen. There's no social protection. There's no police force to protect you. What, who, what, your fate is up in the air, and your fate depends on how exposed you are to physical to weaponry, to physical violence. And that's very scary. And if there is a hill, a, a fire on a neighboring hill, and mortar attacks a um, hundred yards away, and you can hear the rapid fire of an AK-47 going pop, 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 pop and you hear someone screaming, and you hear someone running down the road, like, you, what you, happens to you, I think, is you become deeply afraid, deeply scared. And one can never, uh, never forget what a state of war or a state of violence is like in that sense. And, and even soldiers, you know. If anyone's seen the movie Restrepo, and anyone seen Restrepo? Well, I mean, you know the scene when they're, they're actually, the, most, of the, most of the Afghanistan war, and I'm going to you know, jump around a little bit, but I'll come back to Rwanda if you want. But most of that war is guys looking, I mean, as they present in the film, there's people looking out not knowing where the enemy is. And the one scene where they have where they actually confront the enemy, the soldiers are panicked, panicked, because they might get killed. It's scary. 
That's my sense of war. Now, I'm not a soldier. I haven't been a soldier. I've just been a journalist recovering. I spent a lot of time being in places and talking to people who've experienced it. What about the, what about the genocidal aspects? So, I mean, let's see. In Rwanda, um, I think it depends on whether or not you're talking, who, who you're talking about. If you're a victim, I mean, if you were the targeted population, if you were Tutsis, so the Rwandan genocide was um, a state policy of extermination against the minority Tutsi population in 1994. And the state threw its resources at this project. It threw its resources, uh, the military, the police, the paramilitaries, the civilian administration, and the civilian population, and media, and everything they had at, uh, at destroying the civilian population of Rwanda. And so if you were a target, if you were a Tutsi, uh, from what I understand, it felt like the whole world had turned upside down and that kind of ton of bricks was coming at you and nowhere to hide or very few places to hide. And you expect, you, it was the, as soon as you realized it was happen happening, expected you and your family to get killed. Um, but you know what, what happened is that initially in Rwanda there was a lot of confusion. People didn't really understand what was happening. And as they began to understand what was happening, you saw the separation of populations. Tutsis fled to where they thought they would be safe. Churches, government buildings, um, uh, uh, schools, and banana plantations on hills in people's homes, in people's rafters, in people's pit latrines, which is the dugout uh, you know, pit latrines. Um, they hid in those places, trying to survive. And, and in different ways, they were hunted down and, and killed. Seventy-five percent of the resident Tutsi population of Rwanda was, was massacred in 1994. Um, it's, how does that feel? Um, it's, hard, it's hard. It's hard to uh, describe it. That maybe gives you more, more color. That's very helpful. Yeah. But when I, let's say Mali. Like I was just in Mali. I was recently in Mali. Okay. And the whole northern part of Mali, it's a historic, incredible place where Timbuktu is. I can't go there unless I'm seriously protected because there's a risk that, I mean, or I could go there, but I was strongly advised not to go there because of the risk that I would be captured, taken into one of these hideouts, and I would then be ransomed by this Al-Qaeda affiliate. And no, the way in which war is emerging now, it wasn't so much that the Al-Qaeda affiliates was going to come in and raid my hotel room you know, in Timbuktu. It was that someone would, someone would opportunistically, who'd been involved in the drug trade, say, that guy, I could get $100,000 for that guy. He's white, he's American. That guy's got a good price on him and capture me and take me, and then I become a political weapon in a much broader global conflict in a part of, 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 of West Africa that is so vast and so poorly governed that it, um, uh, you know, that, that's, why this, that's why it's persisting there. So maybe that gives you a flavor for the model. The model. Yes. Yeah. I have two questions. Probably unrelated. Well, maybe the, the metrics, you yeah. say? Okay. By and large, the horizon of analysis here is close to the I haven't heard you any articulate to what degree what you see discernible changes in the actual politics of the union. In other words, to what degree do we see significant shifts after that time? After that time? Because they're, you know, when we move into the Middle East, for example, we can actually the second question is, I think, far more to the point of, point of what you're actually presenting here, which is about the violence versus the perception of violence. Uh -huh. uh, here, you make a very convincing case that, in fact, it's not a wall thing, but it, it seems to me that it's far, it's extremely important that, that I ask you, what accounts for the persistence of our perceptions about African violence in light of the fact that it's not the case? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first question is whether or not the, square, the, 
The, the first question is, what's the effect of the, cold, the end of the Cold War? I think the effect of the Cold War is to see an overall trend towards away from big wars. Right at the end of the Cold War, war surged. Then it declined, and it's in decline, and I anticipate it continuing to be in decline. It stayed at low, steady state. And what you're moving away from are armies that were trained, professionalized, given ammunition, in a way disciplined by the Cold War uh, geopolitics uh, and had clear ideological goals. Angola, Mozambique, <laughs> South Africa, Ethiopia, etc. Uh, um, where there were clear principles, big armies on both sides fighting. And without that external sponsorship, what you're seeing are that your smaller groups of armed bandits in big states uh, that are operating the periphery, who get their financing from trade or international terrorist networks, and who are pests, who are problems. The Congo is a different story, but in general are, are, are drags on states rather than moving to control the state. And I think that that, in a way, is directly related to the end of the Cold War. Um, and that would be what I would hypothesize. And it's, and, uh, yes, there's been some, a little more brutality in wars now, partly, I would say, related to that disciplining, but, um, or the absence of it now, but uh, I think it's really this big shift in the way, in the patterns of war that we're seeing, um, that, that, I, that I, I would be my hypothesis. I have no other explanation because the structural factors remain the same. Still, big states, weak states, natural resource endowments, and all the things that we think cause war, okay, civil war. Um, now, with regard to the persistence, um, you know, I think uh, a student asked me this today in, in class, and um, she's here today, tonight, but I think that one can't underestimate the image of Africa that many people have as being highly tribalized, where violence is easy, where violence happens all the time. Now, why does that image persist? Um, I mean, I mean, part of the story could be racism. I think part of the story is also the absence of knowledge. I mean, how many people in the room knew about the African Sahel? You know, I presented in a way, and I, I, did, I made it complex. I gave you the names of lots of African countries, but probably many people in the room have not heard of these African countries. We don't know much about Africa. And when there's a story, it's a big story of violence. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the narrative of Africa that doesn't require explanation. There's war, there's violence, there's humanitarian catastrophe. If that happens, editors know, and we know as readers, that makes sense to us. We compute that very easily. But if I were to go in and, and give you really much more complicated stories of African politics and everyday forms of cooperation, which I was pointing to, they wouldn't see the light of day. That's true for other regions, too, but I think it's particularly true um, for Africa. I, I know that as a former journalist. So I think that would be part of part of my answer, although I have not studied the issue, but that would be my impression. Yeah. Um, regarding colonialism and its effects, is there any kind of correlation between the country um, and the uh, types of war that was that afterwards? So uh, I've done a little bit of work on this. Um, French and best. <laughs> believe it or not, um, and uh, the Belgians and the Portuguese are the worst. Um, and um, well, um, I think that um, I think in general African states tend to be weak, and external factors matter a great deal in the management of African states. The French, and even the post-colonial period, remain very active in support of particular leaders. They had a number of ar army bases, still do, uh, and effectively provided and had military cooperation agreements with many African states. They were a formidable fighting force that any insurgent knew that they would have to confront if, in fact, uh, they would be challenging the state. It's not to say that didn't happen sometimes, but that the French security guarantee, I think, turns out, I'm not, def you know, to say this in a Francophone country, you know, Many Africans in French colonial states don't like French neocolonialism. <laughs> you know, think the French are, I'm generalizing, but think the French are paternalistic and, and so on and so forth. But if you're looking empirically at the outbreak of war and the levels of violence in war, 
uh, former French colonies and the Catholics. Belgium is a small state. It has no military presence. It has no real geopolitical presence, except for Brussels being in the EU, out of the EU, whatever. I mean, um, and uh, Belgian colonial practices also had their effects. You know, in the Congo, the Belgians were extremely violent. Um, there's a great book written by Ad Bouchard on that. In Rwanda, they exacerbated and exaggerated ethnic differences between the groups. Uh, and I think, I don't know, uh, you know I, but at the same time, I think other colonial states were also quite violent. But I, so I would really point to this, these sort of external factors as the major, as the major issue. But, that, but it's debatable, that would be my answer. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. I have a question about the capacity for regeneration. Uh -huh. Have you found that um, when institutions are completely rebuilt, so completely wiped out, during the war and then have to be built again from the bottom, that that lessens the chance of future violence? Or has there been an ability to kind of rework existing institutions to... Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question and maybe too soon to know. Okay. Um, and the... Um, uh, sorry. Um, what you find is military victory or the total devastation of a place allows new authorities to come in and rebuild without having to inherit the past institutions. So in Liberia right now, there's a kind of, you know, a huge reconstruction effort. The problem is there's no infrastructure in Liberia. You know, still in, uh, still in, the, in, in the capital city, there's no elect running electricity, full stop. Um, uh, at the same, you know, at the same time, I think that in places like Ethiopia, in places like Rwanda, even places like Uganda, where there was a clear military victory at the end of the war, you've seen those <coughs> leaders be able to impose on their states a development program and a pattern of authority that has a lot, given them a lot of flexibility. At the same time, these are places that um, you know, remain highly authoritarian. I don't know how stable they are for the future. I think that's that's the question. I don't. I guess my. I guess really the answer to your question is I don't. Uh, it may be too soon to, have, to know, but it's an excellent question. Uh, it's an excellent question. Yeah. Um, as one of your questions, mechanisms. Um, you mentioned African diplomacy. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think that's been a, that has become a factor now than it was in the early nineties? And looking at civil society, are there any encouraging trends to actually be able to say that civil society might play a bigger role in keeping the peace of the continent? Yeah, I think that I, 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 I don't know. I don't know exactly why African diplomacy has become more pronounced. Um, I think that part of it is a a recognition of the limitations of the United Nations. Part of it is a recognition of the limitations of the United States being able to play kind of international policemen all the time, and a move to kind of African solutions for African problems. Um, I think it's partly that you now have a crop of elder statesmen in Africa, people who like Kofi Annan, um, people like uh, Amadou Toure in Mali, people even like Jerry Rawlings in Ghana. Who, who've given up? <laughs> um, uh, let's see, you're smiling. But um, 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 uh, Nelson Mandela's wife, um, uh, Rock, Rock on the Shell, people who, in one way or another, represent a moment, even if their whole history has not been good, but represent a moment of having given up power and are seen as Democrats, seen as peacemakers, and they can be called upon, and they're influential. They know how to talk to other African leaders. And I think that has been important. So I'd say a part, I'd say part of it is this general trend towards regionalization. The African Union has become stronger in a way. It's not, and never will be, the European Union, but it's become stronger in some ways. Um, you know, civil society. You know, I didn't go through all the complexity. One has to be cautious at some level in the way in which many civil society organizations are not rooted in their societies. They tend to be elite, often donor-driven. 
But at the same time, they are voices. When you go to these places, the voices that you hear in capital cities, in the media and other places, are often these NGOs. And I think that's also important. I don't know how to show it empirically, but I believe it. My colleague, uh, Eileen Tripp, is doing research on this question. I believe that she's right. In post-conflict societies and in pre-conflict societies, I think they're playing an important role. I can't measure, I don't know how to measure it. I don't know how she's going to measure it. But I think it matters. And I think, so I do think it's, I think it's helpful. I think that, I think there's also just accumulated experience now. People are gotten better at saying the right thing. It doesn't always work, but I think they're better and more sophisticated than they have been. Yes? Uh, to kind of go off of Louise's question, um, the impact of diplomacy, uh, you kind of got two different ways of doing it. It's the African Union, uh, it's kind of a multilateral thing, and there's bilateral relations, like, you know, the President of South Africa trying to make Robert Mugabe behave in um, Zimbabwe, kind of. Um, and my question is, like, with the rise of this diplomacy you're talking about, are the effects strong or are they more kind of marginal? Um, yes, but it depends. But what I mean, what kind of, what kind of character is this taking? I, I don't know, but I think uh, even if it's marginal, that's good. Um, and uh, I think I, and I would probably be inclined to say more marginal rather than than huge effects. But when electoral violence happened in Kenya in two thousand and eight it was really Kofi Annan. I mean, I think the Kenyan domestic middle classes were very important to why everyone was worried Kenya was going to go the way of Rwanda. Uh, I don't know how much you remember of that moment. But there was a contested election, the opposition protested, and that devolved into clashes around the country. And people were being killed, and there was a lot of worry that Kenya was going to escalate. I think number one, domestic civil, domestic middle classes in Kenya, which are very developed, um, pressure the actors not to make Kenya grow. But I also think that um, the major political leaders in Kenya came under serious pressure from Kofi Annan, flew into Kenya, spent a lot of time from the head of the African Union, from all the neighboring states, and the again, it's probably too soon to know exactly what the effects were. But from all of the literature that I've read, that seems to have played an important role in getting the sides to compromise and come up with an agreement. And, um, and so I think, you know, I think there is an example of where it mattered. Cote d'Ivoire, where I spent a lot, in West Africa, where I spent a lot of time recently. Um, there, I think, you know, it was really the leadership of regional actors that broke through the impacts in, uh, that had been plaguing <coughs> Cote d'Ivoire for many years. Um, and, and with the Pekina, leader uh, Blas Kapori of Burkina Faso, that really made a difference. And I think, I think that when you listen to the, you know, the president of Cote d'Ivoire talk, he wanted. It was part of, I think, a kind. Of, uh, I think part of a new generation of African leaders that really wanted to separate themselves from their colonial heritage, from the colonial heritage of their states, and were able to talk to other African leaders uh, in, in ways as peers would talk to peers. And that seemed to make a difference in, in moderation. So I don't know, I don't know your answer to your question. Again, part of my point is that we don't pay enough attention to these constraint mechanisms, and we don't have enough research to be able to answer the, the excellent questions that are being posed. But we should be paying attention. Yes. Um, can I ask you about the the war uh, in the Western Sahara mm -hmm. and specifically the what do you think the future of that is? Oh, the war for independence of Western Sahara. Well, that, yeah. it, interestingly, it seems to fit both the big, and yeah. the small, uh, uh, ideological. I, I just. I, it's one of the, I don't know much about that one, bottom line, is, um, you know, it's, uh, it tends to break more into North Africa than it does into Sub-Saharan Africa, and just in terms of my own regional specialization, I tend to know more about Sub-Saharan Africa. It doesn't, there just seems to be a kind of permanent stalemate there with no resolution, but I don't know enough about the ins and outs of it to know if that's going to break or not. Um, but it seems to be locked, it seems to be the sort of steady state of low insurgency or of, 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 uh, but I don't really see that changing. Now, conceivably, if southern Sudan goes independent and Somaliland gets recognized in Somalia, I mean, that is, if you see the breaking apart of some states, that might give some legitimacy, I guess, to secession, that might reignite the whole 
question that could happen, uh, but I just don't, I feel a little uncomfortable speculating. May I ask you a follow-up? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Maybe I'm related. Sure. But um, I'm, I'm just drawing on a conversation I had with uh, another PECON uh, professor, uh, Krishan uh, Olson, maybe you heard today. Um, and a recent article in The New Yorker by Phil Gorovich. Um, really, it was a book review, but uh, really laying out the argument that humanitarian organizations, and I think also peacekeeping operations, had been uh, far more complicit in the, in the continuation of violence, in the continuation of these horrific civil wars, uh, far more than is ordinarily acknowledged, and, and could even make an argument that they had not just they weren't just implicated; they were actively facilitating. One could extend that to the kinds of uh, uh, the presence of, say, Chinese. Uh, corporations or Chinese state corporations uh, making inroads and developing infrastructure in places like <coughs> Congo, et cetera, et cetera, that are continuing to facilitate these civil wars. Yeah. So, I wonder what you think of that argument. Uh, I'm not sure the book that it's being, I haven't seen that in your career piece, so I'm not familiar exactly. I, I can only go on your summary. Okay. Okay. But my general view is that the question to ask the piece of not whether or not it accomplishes everything that we think that we want it to accomplish, but what would have been the difference if it wasn't there? That is, how, what is, compared to if peacekeepers weren't there, compared to when they are there, what's the difference? And I think in general, and I'm sure that I know that there are exceptions, but I think in general, even though they're costly operations, that they, they serve uh, as a constraint mechanism. They provide information to different sides of the conflict. They sometimes create barriers or actual physical buffer zones between combatants. Um, they reduce uncertainty. I mean, all the kind of classic political science explanations I think are valid. And I would point to a book by Paige Fortner, who's, I can give you the site, who I think makes the argument in the most, at least in the political science literature, the most sophisticated argument to do. Now, in Congo, the problem is that there's no state in it's a massive territory, the size of Western Europe, Congo is. It has uh, 18,000 peacekeepers, which is one of the largest peacekeeping operations in the world. But if you think about how many policemen there are in the state of New York, compared to 18,000 peacekeepers, and no roads, no electricity, it's just look at a picture sometime of what Eastern Congo is, and you understand the, the challenges, the real challenges of peacekeeping. I don't want. I, 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 I don't want to be naive. I'm not a cheerleader for peacekeeping. I've been in Cote d'Ivoire the last time I was in Cote d'Ivoire. Bangladeshi guys asking me for money to, you know, to get through the buffer zone, you know, which is totally unprofessional. Um, and in Rwanda, they spectacularly failed. But I think that, nonetheless, uh, I think the general trend are bigger, better, um, um, and affect more effective peacekeeping missions than we see. That's debatable, but that is that is what I would submit. Again, there could be particular, they're clearly in Congo, there were guys who were involved in sex rings, sure there were guys who were making profit on the side. I think all of those things could be true. They, may, they definitely didn't prevent certain atrocities. I think all of those cases are true, but we shouldn't lose sight of the big picture. That would be my, what I would say. You mentioned changing dynamics within wars in Africa and the kind of big wars and arriving smaller wars, and you said that Smaller wars are generally harder to end. So why is that? Why do you think that they're harder to distinguish? Um, you don't know what they want um, is part of the problem. It's hard to negotiate the end to all these conflicts. The Lord's Resistance Army, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, the um, Algodon Secession's movement in Ethiopia, uh, that's a different one. But they want things that people aren't going to give them, basically, is the first point. Second point is that the nature of these conflicts now is you have highly factionalized insurgencies, meaning that you have a group that subdivides and subdivides and subdivides. So you might negotiate with one actor, then they subdivide and become another actor, or two actors, or whatever. And whether it's Darfur, or Senegal, the Casamance region, or, or, uh, or other places, it's hard to know who to negotiate with to end the conflict. And the third issue is that they're trans-border. Al-Qaeda and the Maghreb are moving between five states. 
those five states are, and they're moving in a territory that's essentially not governed, full stop. I mean, it's locally governed, local traditional authorities, but it's not governed by the central state. Too big, states are too weak. And there are five states in the region that have no history of military cooperation, until very recently, um, and that's very difficult to, 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 to deal with. Um, um, and then the other point is that these are on the peripheries of states. You know, in, in Congo's a huge state. Sudan's a huge, these are huge, huge states with very limited infrastructure, and it makes it harder for the state to have a sustained presence in these locations. I think those are all characteristics of, of, of these current wars that make them hard to end. Sure. I just wanted to ask you to expand about the role of China now. Sure. Because it seems to me that people here probably have not got a picture of how big that influence is. And what's, what to me is worrying about China in Africa is that is it not the investment, which I think in many ways has, has benefits, but the political intervention, which is that China definitely has a political for bailing out authoritarian governments. And moreover, I think even in countries where you have electoral democracy, the authoritarian politics, there is a sort of tremendous attraction in this Chinese model where you can have all this wonderful economic growth without the bother of democracy. And uh, in a way, in a situation where you know the advocates for democracy obviously are, are often at that, that foot, that can I think be quite a dangerous influence. Yeah. I think in a way you've answered your own question now, I mean, which is very appropriate. I mean, that, um, that's not something, again, that's something I specifically studied, but I have my own observations. But I think you're right. I think that, you know, look, China's on the rise, um, and that's the biggest, big, the biggest global geostrategic, you know, that's the biggest change in world politics right now. And the Chinese model uh, is one of non-interference. It's an you know, authoritarian export-led uh, economy. That is signaling around the world that there is a very big alternative to the democracy free market model that the West has promoted uh, since the end of the Cold War, and I think that is having big effects. Um, so I think I think in general that, that you're right there. My concern is about the long-term contracts. So China's coming in with long-term contracts, locking in uh, at a particular price, as from what I understand. Um, uh, or maybe not at all as a particular price, but locking in long-term contracts for access to critical resources, oil, cobalt, uh, tin, uh, et cetera. And uh, I worry about what's going to happen in five years if there's a serious price fluctuation or that kind of thing. I don't know. I just don't know. I haven't studied that in detail. But you know, the United States has a, the reason I put it up in, in framing this is the United States has, a, has a, something called AFRICOM, is a way of um, uh, uh, increasing the military, U.S. military presence, in a way, and training African militaries. And the skeptical read of AFRICOM, Africa, which I don't think is true, but is an indicative of the tension, is that it's a presence to counterbalance China, which has this huge basic resource grab going on, and that the future will be a, a, a con armed conflict between China and the United States over access, access to critical industrial resources that Africa has in abundance. I think that's kind of a doomsday scenario. I don't, I don't see that happening. But I think it's indicative of the way in which people are seeing, um, uh, seeing Africa and seeing the rise of China in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you.